Um, I would like to continue uh, with our second panelist, uh, Dr. Spiros Artavanis Tsakonas. Spiros is a professor emeritus of cell biology from Harvard and also professor emeritus of genetics and development biology, Collège de France. Um, perhaps something that is not as well known is that uh, Spiros was the chief scientific officer at Biogen from 2012 until 2016. He's also the co-founder uh, of uh, several biotech companies, three of them I counted, and is the president and co-founder of the philanthropic organization foundation, Sante, competitively providing biomedical research grants in Greece. Uh, he, after a distinguishing career in the US, um, he came back to Greece recently and he's currently the president of SETEC. Um, we have already agreed on some questions that I would address to the audience, to, to the panelists, and they are the following for Spiros. So how to connect Spiro entrepreneurship and Greek institutions, universities, research centers, based on the experience that you have as chair of SETEC, number one, how could HIAS offer support to SETEC? And I know you, the following you, 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 you think very strongly, but it would be good to articulate. What is your view of basic science and entrepreneurship? Thank you very much, Dimitri. Uh, well, let me just say that every single word that Tavernarakis just told you, I completely, completely agree. Uh, the, uh, the disease uh, is well defined. Uh, and the cures, all right? So let me come to the cure. Um, uh, the, the connection between entrepreneurship and, and basic science is a very simple one, and that's quality. Quality of science, quality of basic research uh, will bring entrepreneurship. There's no way you will have a company that comes to Greece to invest in a second-rate uh, a second-rate project or a second-rate endeavor. Science is not science for Greece. It's not bon pour l'Orient, as the French would, uh, would say. It is, it is science is, is science. There's good science and there is bad science. That's what it is. Now, I think that, um, uh, as indeed <laughs> Nectarios uh, articulated, we have a, uh, there is no doubt that there is potential here. There is definitely potential. There are definitely pockets of excellence in Greece, no doubt about it. But there are these perennial uh, uh, problems that have, been, that have been bugging, plaguing, uh, 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 catastrophically, uh, Greek, uh, Greek science. Bureaucracy, fragmentation of all kinds, all kinds of fragmentation, money and uh, responsibilities, um, fragmentation between uh, the, the university uh, and the, uh, and the uh, research centers, as if university research is somehow different from research that is being done, Erevna, that is being done in a, in a university, in a research center. So this is this. And there are, there are also, there's a separation of uh, of uh, governance between the centers, uh, because they are, the centers are under the Ministry of, uh, of um, uh, Anaptixes, or whatever it's called. And I can never understand, I can never, they're, they're changing their tune. Um, and the other one is, uh, uh, and the universities are under the, uh, uh, the auspices of the, uh, uh, of the PDS. Of PDS. So, so I think this is just, just does not make any sense. We are very small, we have very little money, and the money that we, the little money that we have is being completely fragmented, is being left and right without any coordination, without any system, without any plan, without even, we can, if, if we were to copy 100% what's happening in Europe, we will do a good job, frankly. We will do a good job. Of course, the bureaucracy that exists in Greece and that you people are suffering from every day uh, has nothing to do 
with the tremendous, the, the horrendous bureaucracy of Brussels. Uh, even that is, uh, is smaller than, than our kind of difficulties. All right? So I think that, uh, that there is a, a combining, or rather connecting, linking entrepreneurship with, uh, with science, one link, quality. And as, uh, as uh, uh, Professor um, uh, George said, knowledge produces knowledge. This is a unique uh, property, really, all right? Except vir viruses produce viruses, but, but, but knowledge produces knowledge as well. And that can only be to, to, uh, to our benefit. At the ESETEC, we're trying very hard to sort of correct some of these, th this, uh, this, uh, these things. Uh, in terms of entrepreneurship, through the leadership really of, uh, of Aristos uh, and some of our other, uh, of our, of our other uh, SAT colleagues, uh, there has been an effort to uh, improve patent uh, uh, policy, patent applications. There has been an effort to simplify, uh, codify, whatever you want to say about startups. But again, startups, there is no, there's no tree that I will go and get a startup today and another startup <coughs> tomorrow. Startups mean ideas. Startups come from basic science. Whether we like it, it's because it's blue sky science, which is, annoys me enormously when they say that. Uh, but uh, but this, is, this is where innovation comes from. There, there's no doubt about it. I mean, science is the mother of innovation. There's no, there's no other mother. Uh, so. Uh, so we're trying very hard, we're trying very hard, whether we will be successful or not, it remains to be seen. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next panelist is uh, Professor Yanis Ioannidis. Yanis is a professor at the Department of Informatics and Telecom National Capodistrian University. He's also the current recently elected president of the Association of Computing Machinery, started uh, July 1st, 2022, Kaloriz and uh, we're very proud of that. And um, he's um, also the co-founder and inaugural head of the Open Air um, Initiative, has been president of Athena for 10 years, um, and he has also been an entrepreneur, he was a co-founder of a company called Opix. Um, I could ask you a lot about this area, but I will ask you something, as I mentioned to you, that I know you care about, and I think it's quite relevant. Namely, what should be done in the educational system so that the youngsters get exposed to entrepreneurship early, early on, and how early that should be? What should be done so that fail early, fail fast, fail often, as a natural and even educational mentality replacing the risk aver uh, awareness that characterizes a large part of Greek society, Yanni. Thank you very much, <coughs> Dimitri. Uh, this, this question is, is a concern and agony of mine. Uh, I will start my presentation, uh, my, my, my thoughts, exactly in the way that, that Spiros did and saying that every word that Nectarius said, I absolutely agree with. Uh, but I want to say that Nectarius uh, didn't say a few more words, and I want to add them. Correct me if I'm wrong, Nectaria, but you said that the basic obstacles to innovation in Europe and in Greece are innovation performance, innovation funding, and innovation ecosystem. Am I? Do I remember correct? Okay. Well, I want to add a fourth one, and it's innovation mentality for Greece. And, and that's the, 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 the gist of the question. And also in another slide, Nectarios very correctly say, we're extremely successful in educating uh, young scientists, which is absolutely correct. But we are failing miserably to educate young entrepreneurs. And that's a big gap, and, and John Barrs uh, uh, earlier this morning mentioned about stuff that they do uh, at Maryland in, and elsewhere in, in, in the US. And we are missing that. We are a very risk-averse society in general in Greece. 
and therefore also our scientists and our youngsters are very risk averse. Uh, both in my experience at Athena Research Center, which we are, like many other uh, of our research centers in Greece, trying to do technology transfer, trying to move, take from, go from research to innovation and have startups. We've had a very great exit, uh, not a unicorn, but in Greece we've had one unicorn, but uh, I, I will take double corns and even triple corns for the time being uh, until we get to too many, too many unicorns. Um, so both from my experience in, in, in at Athena Research Center and some colleagues at the, at the University of Athens where I am, when you see ideas, students talking about this or that, and then when we say, okay, well, let's, let's take it one step further. I mean, why don't you go and form a startup with some friends and so on and so forth with some professors helping or not helping, it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the, the answer much more often than not is, well, yes, but what, what if I fail? Well, it's okay to fail. You're 20 year old. Now is the time to fail and fail again and again. And, and if you fail 10 times, then okay, go, go and, and, and go to a, to a ministry or to a company with a safe environment. But if you don't fail now, you don't, have, you shouldn't, you don't expect to come to my age and then fail, okay? But this is not something that you can get to, to youngsters' minds easily. And we need to train them for this by adding courses across departments, across disciplines, have project-based education, and not only at the university level. We should have it there, but I think our educational system, even before, I won't go to grammar school, but definitely to, to, to high school, we should have project-based courses where someone should even fund, I don't know if VCs could do this, but someone should give money a little money, 100 euros per team. Okay, go check after some training and invest and spend or come up with something and see if you can sell it around and see if this is $100, you can make it 110 or you lose it all. And it is fine to lose 100, 100 uh, euros. This is something that we are truly missing to feed the innovation ecosystem and uh, to generate true innovation funding and have innovation performance, which are the three elements that Nectario is very, very well identified. But to have at the incoming door many more students, many more people willing to fail. And if we do this, I think it will not solve the entire problem. The others have to be solved. But I think it will be a virtuous circle that we can uh, 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 put in motion and, uh, and become a startup nation of a different flavor. We'll never become Israel because Israel has certain characteristics. But whatever startup nation we can become, nobody else will because we have special characteristics and we can take advantage of them as long as we have the mentality uh, issue solved. Thank you. Thank you, Yanni. Our next uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Vasilis Papakostandinou. Vasilis is the co-founder and chairman of the MIT Enterprise Forum in Greece, the Greek chapter of an MIT-inspired global network. He's also the co-founder of a startup company, technology company. So he brings to the panel extensive experience in the startup environment in Greece. So in that respect, Vasily, what I would like to ask you is um, what lessons regarding entrepreneurship, do you think you could bring uh, from the MIT Enterpre Enterprise Forum to the Greek environment? What mechanisms have to be put in place to promote entrepreneurship? And what are the bridges that are required in the academic community? Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, Dimitri, for inviting me. Uh, obviously, I'm not an academic, so... Uh, 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 <laughs> maybe uh, sometimes they they confuse me for the singer, which I'm not also. So I have a I have a personality issue here. Um, but um, yeah, uh, I think you know we are here at the uh, Eugenius Foundation, which I, I happen to be an advisor to the board. That comes from shipping, and I think technology development has a lot of things to learn from shipping. 
to begin with because um, you know we are the largest uh, shipping community in the world and uh, shipping and technology uh, has some similarities uh, so I'll just point them before I go to your question and the similarity is that we love to be here to live here uh, but we are better comp competing with the rest of the world uh, instead of among us so um, technology can provide that thing so um, in 20 12, we started the MIT Enterprise Forum, as Dimitri said, uh, it's an MIT-inspired network uh, that started back in the 70s to help uh, MIT alumni become entrepreneurs because they were facing similar problems. Um, a lot of them, they were staying in the academia or going to large organizations and there were no skills or ways to, to train them. So we uh, tried in 2012, uh, 10 years ago actually, 2012, uh, amidst the problems that we had that year to bring uh, uh, MIT Enterprise from here because we thought that the opportunity uh, that Nectarios described um, is, is larger and higher than the, the obstacles that we see here. Um, and uh, we put an ambitious goal to make Greece uh, a tech hub by 2021 and I'm sure you know that it happened or partially it happened uh, but it was a joke. Uh, we did not set out to do that. Uh, we just wanted to see beyond the 2020 horizon and you know as MIT geeks we, we thought that this wouldn't be a, a, a good joke. Uh, but the reality is that over these years we have accelerated more than 200 startups. Um, I would say about 25, 20, 25 percent of them coming out of or be related to um, uh, universities and research centers, uh, companies like uh, uh, RT Safe, PD Neurotechnology, uh, Rescue Biotech, George is here over there, um, uh, Nanoplasma, Advantis, or uh, PC uh, Nanomaterials. Um, and to my amazement, to our amazement, we saw that um, uh, researchers can become great entrepreneurs as long as they uh, are giving um, a set of tools uh, uh, and, and changing a little bit the mentality. Um, so uh, the, le the lessons are hopeful. Uh, I think um, the mechanism, the structure uh, requires uh, investing more uh, uh, in educating at different levels, uh, both at the, uni uh, maybe uh, at, at the high school, but certainly at the university level, um, and, and requires a lot of mentoring. Um, uh, the, the problem is not that uh, we don't have, um, you know, uh, good science necessarily, is that sometimes it is applied in not so relevant, not to say irrelevant uh, applications. So mentorship um, and, and discussions like that help uh, um, researchers focus their uh, their skills to problems that are relevant and 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 to this respect uh, besides the acceleration program uh, that uh, that we have completed the eight, uh, the eight cycle we are also trying to do uh, what we call incentive price competitions they are modeled much like uh, what professor Yorsos uh, mentioned in the morning uh, about uh, grand challenges we did the first one uh, with uh, ADAP, uh, with the uh, uh, help of uh, Professor Vavarigu last year, and we got 170 applications of people that they had no prior um, entrepreneurial experience, but they were intrigued uh, uh, by um, by uh, the, the 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 targets and the goals and the and the the difficulty of the problem. So we need to get more of that. Initially, not very grand challenges because um, we have to build the skills. It's, you know, you, you have to gradually increase the difficulty together with uh, the capacity of the people to adapt to that, but eventually we have to do that. And the last thing we learned is that, you know, uh, organizations have to work together. When we started uh, MIT Enterprise Forum officially in, the, in September 2013 uh, in this uh, very room, uh, we set out that we wanted to build bridges with the Greek tech diaspora, as we called it at that time. Um, now it's called uh, Hellenic Innovation Network, uh, a company that we co-founded with Marina Hatsopoulos and a few other people like uh, uh, Michael Bledsas in Boston. And the reason is to get diaspora closer to what is happening here. Uh, sometimes diaspora, especially in the beginning, were uh, rightfully angry with what is happening here and they were coming only uh, for vacation. Uh, it is great to see that people um, in this room come back to, to help. Uh, they see value in what is happening here. Oh, maybe it is substandard to what we see in other places of the world, but 
uh, you know, there's huge opportunity. The risking deep techn uh, technology uh, is still very uh, cheap here. I think it would still, outside computer science, it's a fourth to a fifth, which means that for every startup that you invest with a similar team in Boston, you can fund four here. So um, I would say we need to work closer uh, at the university level. Um, uh, this year, uh, we launched, again, in this room, uh, a, a, a Greek book, the Greek version of a book called Discipline Entrepreneurship by Professor Bill Ole, and we are happy that already four or five universities uh, are using this book to uh, introduce entrepreneurship to their students. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful that... Uh, ...invited me to uh, join uh, a course that they are doing. So it is hopeful. The things that we copy from elsewhere work, and we need just to put more resources and be patient because uh, as Dimitri, you asked, you know, it took us 10 years, so I'm sure starting high as now, you have plenty of time to, uh, to build stuff over the next four, 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. Our last panelist is uh, Professor Nikos Parayos. Nikos is a distinguished professor of mathematics in Ecole Centrale Superlec, one of the Grand Ecoles of Engineering in France. Um, but he's also the founder and chief executive officer of Thera Panakia. It's a 65 people company in three continents, including a development office in Athens, harnessing AI to develop cutting edge software for more efficient and precise cancer care, currently in four continents. Uh, so he brings both academic and entrepreneurial background to the panel. So Nico, I would like to ask you uh, the following, what lessons from your experience in France, uh, you learned that you feel are relevant for Greece. And something else that I know you believe, that um, clearly successful companies need not come from universities, because that's what we have been talking primarily so far. So what other models are there, and what can we learn for Greece regarding that aspect? Yes, so I would like also to thank the organizers for the invitation. Usually I'm an outlier on different panels, so I think it's going to be the case also today. Uh, I mean, so I will just simply explain the French paradox, which is very similar to the Greek paradox. Until 2015, actually, France has zero unicorns. Zero. And France has uh, institutions like CNRS, like INSERM, like INRIA, which, of course, they are not founded at the level of MIT or Stanford or Harvard, but they are not as bad as in Greece. I mean, they, they get a substantial amount of money. <coughs> we have great researchers that they end up yeah, winning Fields Medals Prize, Turing Awards. So the, the education system and the research itself was actually very, very powerful, and we're producing high-level research. And despite this fact, I mean, there was, as I said before, zero unicorns. And when President Macron was elected, uh, I mean, so his ambition was that by 2025, France should have at least 25 unicorns. That was the ambition on 2017. Today we're on 2022, and France has already 37 unicorns. The educational system hasn't changed. There are no more money that are invested in the research as was before. There are many very simple things that happen. The first, there was a legal framework that allows university professors and public servants to actually to take a partial leave from their position, maintain their position up to six years, and then return to their position to find a startup. So that means you create a framework where you encourage people to start something new and to take a risk which was not there before. Even more, this framework for the people that actually were leaving the university if it was a university startup, could guarantee 12 months of full salary paid from the French state. If you do that, then you give the, actually to people, you know, the desire to go to the next step. The next thing that happened actually is that they put in place a mechanism which is called acceleration companies that are founded by the French public investing company. And the role of these companies is to provide seed fund for university startups. It can be up to half a million, and the reimbursement is there if there is a success. If the company fails, then it means these are public money, then there will be no reimbursement, and the reimbursement will be based on revenues of the company in the future to come. So universities now allows professors 
to actually start the project, take the risk because they can actually do that for up to six years and then return while their salary is paid for the first year. This was on the university side. Then in France, we have very interesting tax benefits for innovative companies. Since we have people from the Ministry of Industrial Development, I think it's the right time to say it. If you are actually considered as an innovative company and there is a formal process of reviewing what is an innovative company or not, first of all, you are not paying social contributions. That means that if you pay someone, you don't have to contribute on the retirement as employer. So this decreases significantly the cost to the startups to hire new people with good packages. That's the first one. The second, which is also very interesting, is that you are getting tax benefits independently whether you are making or losing money on all the research money that you are investing. So if your budget is 1 million euros and the 1 million euros is devoted to research, the French state at the end of the year, even if you are losing money, it will reimburse you 300,000 euros. So there is also fiscal difference. So I mean, I think investing on fundamental research is something that will make a big difference, especially in Greece, where we have really a severe issues of founding, meritocracy, and all the matters we've heard before. But as I explained before, uh, France has a great research and educational system, and uh, there was not converted or there was not a success story on creating startups. So we need to change, and uh, there's something that was said from Yanis, which is very important. It's a question also of mortality. You have to make people believe that they can deliver a project. I mean, we live in a place where when you start something, by default, people are trying to explain you that things will not work. This has to change. If you cannot convince people that things can change, they cannot put, you know, they cannot have the ambition that they should have, especially in starting such a project. So three words, legal framework, reinforcing, and giving the ability to hire to academics to go to the next level of, you know, industrial creation of value, that's very important. Clear, you know, policies coming from the industrial development on how the state can encourage this, because at the end, this money comes to the state. If a company is successful, it will pay taxes. And that the third thing is actually starting from very early stage, convincing, you know, try to educate people, young people, but no, not only young people. I think I, I, I did the startup when I was 45, so people were looking to me like crazy. Uh, so, I mean, so you can actually make the difference if you believe on something and change the mentality that, you know, things can happen. So this is the three things that I can add from my French experience. Thank you, Nicole. I would like to also uh, ask uh, all of our panelists to be brief in the following question. So I will also start with the audience. Suppose you have one action to propose. And suppose you have enough resources. In other words, suppose Hayas is very successful. It raises a billion dollars, the billion dollars that uh, Apostolis talked us in the morning, or different. But you have uh, sizable resources in your hands. What would be the one action, don't tell me five, one, that each of you will propose? And uh, I would like all of you to participate, but the first can volunteer. No volunteers yet. Why okay. Not? Why not? Why not? If I fail, I fail, right? It doesn't matter. As we learn from Yanis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fail you're often young enough. Enough. and yeah, early. I'm young enough, for sure. Right? All right. Uh, I think that uh, um, linking, again, you know, I will, I will harp my theme on, uh, on uh, quality of basic science. I think that's, that's a key for me, notwithstanding what we just heard. I completely, you know, I agree with that. All right, but uh, but I think that uh, if you can uh, put the, your billion dollars to professorships, that will that will take the money that uh, Nectarius gets from his university and triple it or quadruple it, then you can bring a lot of people back here. So you you will hire high quality people. Yes, in basic science. Primarily. Not, uh, prim but you know, not necessarily. I'm only, just understanding. Only, only in basic science. But, okay. Good. But I can, bring, I can bring diaspora people of very high quality and accomplishment, bring them back in, back here, uh, in, uh, in a way that they can Great. live thank and you. they can uh, uh, support thank their you. children. Nectaria, no pressure. So, coming back to, to the regularity of uh, dispersing funding and uh, 
what we discussed about uh, consistency, what I would do is really set up a mechanism that would distribute funding uh, uh, across the spectrum, not just for research, but also for developing uh, innovation that would be based on meritocracy uh, and would be uh, regular, would be uh, very predictable and would be sizable enough to provide uh, uh, substantial funding that is required to do real work. Like Not NSF, just, uh, for example, it's regular, something, it's sizable, and, and exactly, that's what yes, you have in mind. Yes, yes, something like the NSF that's based but, on meritocracy. But just to press the point, mm -hmm. uh, if the objective is to develop entrepreneurship, not to create knowledge, mm -hmm. to create dollars from knowledge, as well as knowledge, mm -hmm. would still be your answer? Yeah, I think that still you need a mechanism to be able to, to, to disperse funding in a meritorious way. So, Which is even, not done even, today in your mind? Uh, I, I don't think so, no. Okay. Today, yeah. That's something to note. Okay. Thank you. Shall I? Of course. <coughs> I, I will take. I will take the phrase of Nectarius of uh, spread. I mean, one billion dollars is is a lot of. It's quite a bit of money. Uh, and I won't put it on only one stage of the life cycle of of creating uh, of the triangle of knowledge, so to speak. I will spread it, I won't give you percentages now. It requires more thoughts. But yes on basic science, but also yes on funding startups, because we have the ecosystem of VCs, which have quite a bit of money, but it's not enough. We need more money. So even on, on, at that level, I would put money. And to be true to, to what I said before, also going to the very early stages and educating uh, youngsters from high school on, I would put money in, in, in a meritocratic but also inventive ways on how to do this training of entrepreneurship. So starting from the 15-year-old all the way to the 100-year-old entrepreneur that needs uh, 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 VC funding and support for uh, her or his startup, uh, we need money across the board. Um, I would split uh, the amount in two ways. Uh, first, to create campaigns like the ones that we have for tourism, to get people to understand that they can live their dream while working in Greece instead of just coming here for a couple of weeks and, and then going back. And the rest will be to attract uh, uh, the top entrepreneurial companies in the world, uh, the Googles and whatever else you have in mind, uh, that they can train hands-on the people that are coming out of universities and they will break this uh, uh, cycle, the, the mentality that we're discussing, and also expose problems that they these people then can go out and, and, and create. Because the, the majority of the startups we see are usually people that they work in large organizations. They see the, um, the, uh, uh, the issues that they are not solved and they go out with that knowledge and, and build it for. Okay, again, uh, I will be a little outlier. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it's a successful project uh, requires uh, people, uh, technology, network and money. Uh, so I think in Greece we have people. We may have technology, we don't have network, and we don't have money. So if I had one billion, I think first uh, a big bulk of the money, I will invest them on joint grants between research institutions and industry, especially startups, for creating value that can be transferred to the real world. That's the first thing. Another bulk of money, I will use them as seed founding. Today, the hardest part for the startup is going from the idea to the proof of concept. If you are able to solve a proof of concept, whether you are a Greek company, an Ukrainian company, or an Israeli company, you're going to be able to get money. Maybe not in the same conditions, but you'll be able to get money. Today, what we need in Greece is to have seed money. So again, I will make an analogy. So I will put the money on a public investment fund that is actually not uh, uh, the, the, the managing part is not banned by the public state but for the private people that have experience where the aim is actually to create seed funding that can push startups coming from universities but also startups coming from people that at some point went to the university have an idea to create value that's how we'll use the money thank you I would also like to ask another question in the audience we have 
the rectors of the two largest universities of, of Greece, uh, both uh, the National Technical University and ECPA. There might be others, I simply do not know. So, of course, I'm sorry that I did not know, my, my mistake. That's good, even better. So, um, what would be your advice? What would you advise the, the rectors to be an action that promotes that? What would be your, your view? Again, the volunteers, Let's, let's have a dialogue as opposed to all of us talking, you know. Any, any volunteers? Yanni, you are, uh, you are, uh, you are, you are uh, flirting with the... Uh... I, I, uh, I mean, I only said one thing about adding entrepreneurial courses to the curriculum that go across departments, across schools, across all these things. And the other one is already in the making, technology transfer offices, which also require uh, uh, education, require experts in this, and external advisors from, from industry or from, uh, 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 from people that, that have lived entrepreneurship in, in, in their blood, not just theoretical, and, and create uh, uh, emotion in, in the academic uh, world not just the professors, not, not just us, but the students, with or without us, I insist on this, uh, to, to enter, um, uh, uh, I'll say again, use the word, to change their mentality, take a step that may be risky, and learn how to do this. And of course then, with the appropriate policies, uh, to get the spin-offs. I mean, there are many other ways of technology startups, but I think the spin-off is the, the DNA of, of innovation, uh, and, and that's we, where we should uh, focus on. Are, are you giving money to the, uh, to the deans? <clears throat> right. I think that the most important thing, in my view, is the number of students that these people are always obliged to suffer. Uh, the quality of uh, education is going down, is inversely proportional with the number of students these people are being pushed every year to accept. So that's what I would do. That will increase entrepreneurship? Uh, I think eventually it would. Okay. Get, get going from my thesis of... Uh, I don't know. So, yeah, uh, not, uh, not to really brag about it, but I think we have great universities. I'm also a student of those universities. I graduated from the University of Thessaloniki. I believe, though, that uh, universities are, are, are tremendously underfunded in Greece. So I think this is, this is the real uh, source of all, all problems that universities face these days. They are underfunded, so they cannot set up mechanisms that would translate the results that are generated within university laboratories to uh, entrepreneurship uh, products, services, etc. So uh, this is something that needs to be taken into uh, consideration. And also, of course, I think uh, there needs to be a, a, a more direct collaboration with research centers. Because the, the research ecosystem of Greece is, this, is now uh, again fragmented, uh, Spiros already mentioned that, and uh, this is something that we need to work on. We need to have a better integration of universities and uh, research centers. But the uh, underfunding and chronic underfunding is creating a lot of problems with infrastructure, uh, laboratory facilities, equipment, etc. These uh, these things create pathogens. They 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 repel people. So this is something we need to. do. But perhaps I didn't make myself very clear. I recognize underfunding. However, we, we are where we are. The question is, what can Greek universities do? The leadership of these universities, given the level of funding, mm -hmm. to improve further. I got some answers. Nico, I know you have. Uh, yeah, so yes, actually I will again second to Yanis. I mean, what he said is actually uh, the right thing to do. Start by, you know, uh, maybe not uh, even earlier than the university level for courses allowed in entrepreneurship, but there is something else. If we look on today on success stories, they are interdisciplinary. Data is bringing value on medicine. Data is bringing value on networks. Biology is bringing value on many different domains. So if we want to be successful, 
Of course, because if I had another billion euros, I would have given to the university directors. But if I don't have the billion, I will ask them to reinforce interdisciplinary programs between science, medicine, biology, chemistry. This is where you can create value because you can do what you know is happening in pharma. You are doing repositioning. You take a technology in a domain that is already there and you know, and then you apply it in another domain and that's what creates value. So something that is feasible, doesn't require huge investment, can be also beneficial for the university because it can be, bring money, are interdisciplinary programs at graduate level. Vasily, any last words? Uh, well, um, when I left here, uh, I, I was trained as an engineer at the National Technical University of Athens, and at some point a friend of mine told me about the VC, and I told him, you know, I'm an engineer, I have to build things, I don't know anything about companies. I had to go to MIT and, and get in, in love with the whole concept. So, uh, and the reason I did it, because I, I got involved in so many um, things, like classes, the uh, uh, competitions, meeting people that they were very successful. So. I think um, many um, uh, alumni from Greek universities have uh, s uh, stellar performance not only in academia but also in entrepreneurship and uh, we are happy to have uh, the scientists but we don't in, uh, celebrate the, um, uh, the successful entrepreneurs. So um, having them as part of courses, like you know, um, many courses are taught by professors that they have a super, you know, an academic approach to entrepreneurship. Uh, having hands-on people that they invite these people to talk to 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 the students, I think it will it will be uh, very powerful uh, for the students and it will accelerate. Thank you, Vasily. I would like to open to the audience, Christo. I would like to uh, ask the audience to ask a question briefly, not a positioning, a question. So, uh, I guess no, I need to formulate now the question. I live in the bubble of Silicon Valley and I can compare ecosystems. And we're missing two major things. One is privately funded VCs. Not people invest in public money, but invest in their own money and private money. And we can talk about, I would like to hear your comments, for example, why did the American VCs go to China? Why did they choose to deal with the Chinese Communist Party? And few of them came to Europe. That's an interesting thing to comment upon. The second thing is exactly what Vasily said. We need big companies for multiple reasons. First of all, they provide employment guarantee. It's much easier to jump to a startup when you know that you can always go back to Google and get your cozy salary back, right? Uh, just let me finish one thing. The second thing is what Vasily said which is uh, you learn the business practice, the customers, and the technical needs, and you jump out and you compete with your own company. So I would like to hear what do we do to attract first-rate, privately funded VCs, and what do we do to attract big companies? I know it's not a billion dollars. It's something else. Very quickly, we are attracting very big companies already. And we are attracting them because of the great talent that we have in our students that we educate in the flawed and, and, and traumatized educational system that still produces great students. I mean, we heard Pfizer and Microsoft and Amazon and, and others are on the way and, and they are coming. So getting more uh, uh, better students uh, we'll get more, more, uh, uh, more bigger companies. The, the first question, I don't, I don't have an answer to. Victoria. Yeah, so um, this, this is indeed a problem, but I think that the, the, we need to be able to, uh, to provide support to those ideas, innovative ideas, that are too risky for the private sector to become involved. So the private sector will become involved once you have a, a mature TRL. But at very early TRLs, and this is what we need to convince, not just as Greece, but also as Europe, we need to be able to convince that we can produce uh, disruptive innovation. This is something that we are lacking both in Greece and in uh, Europe. Now, uh, indeed, uh, as Yanni said, uh, big companies are coming. Pfizer is one example. Actually, uh, BioNTech is a startup of uh, Gur Sahin, a Turkish researcher, that got funding from the ERC. So he was supported by a, a European instrument to generate uh, their, you know, his, uh, together with his wife, his, uh, this startup that was then acquired by Pfizer. So this was an example of innovation that happened in Europe, but is now being exploited by a company based on uh, the United States in uh, New York. 
So this is what we need. We need to also have instruments that can provide support for that critical interval where the, public sec the, the private sector cannot become involved yet. It's too risky for them. And then uh, we can convince, by doing this successfully, we can convince the private sector to become involved, and the Pfizer example is one uh, such example. Spiro? Yeah. Nectari, I mean, the, the industry has not given money to uh, research here. That has not happened. I was uh, envious when he said that you have never written an NIH or whatever, an NSF grant. Uh, and that's, that's wonderful. That's great. But there's no chance in doing that here. And for the companies, uh, smaller companies, I mean, Pfizer, fine. Is what's in, in, uh, in for them? They'll say, what, what is in for them? So if you had some funding, so for example, a charitable funding, I mean, there are Greeks that can write a $100 million check uh, without losing any of uh, their yachts or whatever, okay? So, but they don't do it. They have not done that. These are funds that could be given exactly the way actually Nectaria said, that you give some for, for, for new things, risky things, and if you lose, you lose, no problem. They've done it for universities in the United States. You know the Nyarcos, uh, Johns Hopkins. I know Nyarcos, I know, also know Martinos, Lances, Lances Martinos in, in, in Switzerland. Yes, but they have yeah. not. And why haven't that done here? <laughs> because they are not, they, are not uh, they, they don't have confidence in the yeah. system. Yeah, trust. And, and also, but also in the quality of people. You know, of we have not convinced them that there is enough quality mm -hmm. of people here that they should I mean, that their risk is not that enormous. Yeah. Plus, Thank you. we have never really uh, drawn on their patriotic... Uh, I would yeah. like to give you opportunity to other people. <laughs> Just one, well, I just want to add that, uh, sorry, something sorry, about sorry, that sorry, point. Sorry. I mean, 20 to, seconds. Yes, 20 seconds. Uh, Lazis, of all places, is investing in Switzerland, uh, supporting research in Switzerland. Yeah, Actually, exactly. the, the Howard Hughes equivalent yeah. funding yeah. institution yeah. in yeah. Switzerland yeah. is uh, backed by Lazis money. Okay. So, just uh, other questions, <laughs> Aristo. I'm taking the risk of failure here, but I'm asking you instead of asking a question, can I make two points as a venture capitalist on what was said up to now? Not questions. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's that's tough. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, first, um, the panel rightfully said that resources are missing in the various stages. Uh, but because I have tried, uh, my team has tried very hard to work with spin-offs out of Greek universities, and we also have the experience of investing in two spin-offs of Oxford University with Greek founders. Um, I have seen that there are certain mechanisms that are really on the micro level, not on the institutional level, that are difficult to establish. And one thing is that a, 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 senior, a senior scientist or a professor who thinks they have an important invention being made does not usually understand that they and the people in their laboratory can bring it to a, a mature enough TRL level. They think they can do it, but they cannot. And, and this is a mentality issue that is slightly different from what we said. The few cases of Greek startups that were started by professors that are succeeding happened when one of their best students, who also happened to have an entrepreneurial streak in them, said, OK, I'm going to leave the laboratory and be the CEO, and you, professor, support me. And so that person took the risk that Yanis was talking about. So this is a mechanism that we need to somehow instill. Okay, uh, in Oxford, what I've seen in the startups is that almost from day one, they recruit a CEO who is from the industry, and they also get somebody from the lab to go out of the lab and work with the CEO on the science. But to do that, to be able to bring, you know, well-paid CEOs, or uh, you have to be Oxford. It's difficult to do that in Greece, but at least you need to have a young person who wants to t take the risk. And now I'll take the prerogative from the president and talk about the diaspora, which we haven't talked about much in this panel. What, 
what we have been trying to do uh, in my venture capital fund, which is a science-based fund, I mean, we, we invest only in deep technology. As I said earlier, we have been trying to bring spin-outs out of universities and have not been very successful. Where we have been successful is where we found Greek founders in the States or in the UK who understand both the science and the market and said, we will fund you if you set up an important part of your team in Greece. And this has been working very, very well. Uh, so the diaspora can play a very important role in establishing science-based you know, startups in Greece. We have here in the room Vangelis Vergetis, who is the co-founder of Intelligentsia. Vangelis was at McKinsey in New York with his co-founder, Dimitris Kaltsas, and they did that. We have 10 people in the States, 60 or 70 people in Athens. The States, they do business development and sales. In Athens, they do all the product development. And it's a deep tech company, eh? AI for the pharma business. That is a one type of model that I feel can be very successful. Thanks. Um. Yes, uh, Stefan Skaxiras, Uppsala University. I have a small question about um, intellectual property. So Nectario showed this nice graph where Sweden was high up in the top and Greece was not you know, below <laughs> a lower. Uh, in Sweden, uh, all the IP belongs to the professors and the students. It doesn't belong to the university, it doesn't belong to research institutions, it doesn't belong to anyone else except the inventors. Do you think there's a correlation between the positions in this IP policy, or do you think there's any IP policy? Well, in the, just the factual element, uh, where I am, uh, the intellectual property on a patent, only one-third belongs to the university, one-third to the department, one-third to the, uh, the provost, let's say. So it's not a hundred. That's a fact. I now agree, you but do you think it's, we could do better if we change that, and how? Or yeah. So, yeah, it's good that we have Kalis Ritsas here. Uh, uh, indeed, very recently, ah, okay. So, recently we've had a new law uh, governing how uh, spin offs are created, and this is a very important step in the right direction, I think. It's a, it's a big step, but we need the other half, and that's exactly uh, how we deal, we, how we manage intellectual property. In Greece, the legislature that we have now, the, the framework that we have, uh, is very anachronistic. It's, it's, uh, it originates in the 80s, even 70s. Some, some regulations are uh, predate uh, the, the Second World War. So we need a more flexible framework. I think there, is, uh, pl there are plans for having such a new law coming to the parliament. So, but I think Michalis can tell us. Uh, Mr. Nenes? It was pressed before, okay. I want to bring it up again to highest and actionable items. And I would like to ask, do you think that there's room here for some kind of uh, workshop or brainstorming session where we define a unique opportunity to Greece? For example, the Ljoklada, the agricultural waste, as a way forward to provide raw materials to do something that uh, can also offer entrepreneurship. You know, examples like this. Yeah, so this is probably a question for Hayas, not... So but what I would say... for the panel, I mean, do of you course, think... But, but just to mention something that I think is, is useful for the future as well, is that clearly there are many ideas that have been mentioned today. Uh, we noted many of them. We cannot do all of them. I think part of our, uh, our effort as the Hayas uh, board is to, to decide where to focus on. And this is something we will brainstorm and discuss. So definitely I... We noted the idea, but now I would like to still give the floor. Nico. Yeah, so uh, as I said before, I think what we're lacking in Greece are money and network, and Hayas actually it's the best place to have a network, especially if you want to go beyond Greece. So finding a way, especially for tech companies coming from universities where people have already collaborators, involving people who have academic or industrial appointments in Europe or in the US from involved in Hayas, will be a huge accelerator for all these projects. So if you want to do something concrete, 
we need to put in place a mechanism when there is a project, some people are act as advisors and to have to think of a way of involving these people either as stock options. But today what we are lacking in Greece is actually network. And so you, when you have a great project, if you don't have, it's not the same thing if you have a university professor from Harvard to make uh, uh, Petros happy. We're saying, oh, I know this project and these people are good. And it's not the same thing if you knock a door and say, ah, I'm a startup in Greece working on that. So hires can offer a network. We just have to find a way of actually finding mutual, you know, interesting relationship between people because network means time, means credibility. But I think this is something concrete. We just have a huge impact. Yes, Silly. Uh, the, um, the events have to be on both sides, uh, bringing people from abroad, sometimes non-Greeks here, to, uh, in, to share ideas that they've been discussing or developing, um, and also doing stuff, for instance, we, uh, Hellenic Innovation Network does a lot of stuff in, in Boston, and uh, in early May we had uh, 200 people in the room that we have never seen before uh, coming to listen to two uh, top uh, people from uh, the life sciences industry and five startups that uh, fr from Greece that presented there. So these opportunities, um, uh, as Nico said, you know, uh, strengthen the network on both sides uh, and give um, um, the, not only the opportunity but the confidence to the people here in Greece that they are doing stuff that they are relevant. You know, the worst thing is that building something that you are not, as I used to say, that you are not sure is going to, you know, uh, go forward and you don't really know that there are people uh, on the other side of the Atlantic that they are way before you uh, and they are just uh, marching forward because nobody is trying to stop them. So, yeah, I wanted to follow up on what Vasily was talking about, about the Hellenic Innovation Network. And I was wondering if you could see concrete ways. I'm sorry. Concrete ways. Let's say you've seen today a little bit what HIAS is. I personally know a little bit about Hellenic Innovation Network. Maybe we can have you on record on how you see uh, the two organizations collaborate. Well, I, I would have to defer to the president, Marina Hadzopoulos, to do it. <laughs> uh, well, I, th I think there are many uh, opportunities to work together. And uh, if nothing else, it just set the stage that two organizations with similar names are doing things that they are um, uh, not competing, but uh, uh, collaborating. So uh, I think uh, Hellenic Innovation Network focuses more on building awareness um, uh, abroad about the, uh, the innovation that happens in Greece and tries to bring the diaspora closer. Uh, and Hayas can, you know, use your network to convince people to listen more, come here. So I think there are plenty of things and uh, Marina will be happy. Yeah. I, th I think that what we try to do is we try to have a house, as I said, in, in Greece. And having this house in Greece, I think this could be uh, a great place for innovators and venture capital to go and access all these members of the diaspora and their partners in, in Greece. Well, Hellenic Innovation Network is actually a 501c3 in the state, so we don't have a house in Greece, but we would be happy to, uh, uh, to welcome you. We, we are also a 501c in the states, but we can have, we have checked that we can have an organization in Greece. Anyway, we follow up. Yeah. Okay, the night is coming, the dinner is close. Any final burning question? One, somebody who really feels strongly that they should have a final word. No surprisingly, Mr. Barras. I bring you my experience from almost 13 countries in the Europe and about 25 states in the US. I agree with everything you said, there's one thing missing, which at attacks particularly the hesitation, the fear, and so on and so forth. And this is the concept of guided entrepreneurship of George Turing, who was a dean at Berkeley. So the idea is you create a holding company, you start the companies, you find them customers. It's not just an incubator, it's more than that. And then you let them fly. And that has been very successful. It's similar to the accelerator companies in France. I know them because I am uh, chair of the scientific board for the Comins Lab in Rennes, and they take their products from invention, I try to discriminate between invention and innovation, through this company and the good products. So question, can Hayas 
try to develop this concept. There are papers on this, there are methodologies. It's called guided entrepreneurship. The company that Turing built was Technicron. It started about 50 startups and several professors from Berkeley and others, they were involved and they were hesitant to do it themselves. And this was the right instrument to get it going. And one more thing, what Aristo said, and we practice it in Maryland. Uh, you need people to help you with marketing. All right. That's why the venture capitalists, when you go with an idea, they stick to you as CEO and a marketing person. This was a comment, not a question. So. Um, I would like to close the section. I'll tell you a few things I noted that made, uh, made an impression on me. This is not, of course, very scientific, but these are from my notes. I heard throughout the day the, some desire for increasing in this interdisciplinary education and its effects. Number two, I heard entrepreneurial courses. Uh, these are um, stronger connection between at least the Hellenic Innovation Network and hires. Um, I thought the guided entrepreneurship that, that um, Dr. Barras mentioned is worth uh, further discussion. I'm certain there were many others, but I would like to thank you all.